Super Talk Mississippi Media Production. You're listening to the Rebel Report Podcast, where it's all Ole Miss all the time. Here's your host, Michael Borky. All right, let's try that again. Welcome into the Rebel Report. My name is Michael Borky. Appreciate you being here on this Sunday night. For those of you that stuck around after the little equipment snafu on the first one, I appreciate you. That's just uh, that's what happens when you have equipment as old and as bad as mine. But we are getting through it. I'm glad that you are here. And let's actually talk about this game um, for real this time instead of me trying to figure out how to turn my camera on and off after it disconnects. So glad you guys are here. Um, there's a lot to talk about with this game. And going into the Oklahoma game, I thought there were a lot of questions for Ole Miss. And I don't think, even though they got a double-digit SEC win, I don't think all of the questions uh, that we had about this team were answered in spite of the aforementioned double-digit win. I want to read a lot of your comments tonight, but I've got some things I want to get to first. I I want you to drive the conversation but I do want um, to, to get a few things. I, I don't know if off my chest is the right word, but uh, some conversation, some additional conversation about this game. Or read your comments, and we'll get out of here on this. It's, a, it's been a beautiful day, this beautiful Sunday night here in Mississippi. So, again, my name is Michael Borky. I invite you, please, to subscribe to the podcast. If you have not already, wherever you get them, just search Rebel Report. And if you like what you hear, subscribe and leave a rating and a review. And leave a comment on the video if you're watching after the fact. I would love to to see what you have to say. Even though you're not here live, you're still here. So I want to hear from you. So leave a comment there as well. And this edition and every edition of the Rebel Report is presented by the Gregory Law Firm. DJ Gregory, the Gregory Law Firm, for all of your personal injury, small business, or contract disputes. If you're a small business owner, you are likely going to need legal advice at some point. So even if you don't necessarily need his services today, DJ Gregory has got you covered. He's in Saltillo, but he can service you anywhere. Here's his number, 662-397-9799. Save this number. If you've been personally injured and you need need help today, call him today. But if something happens to you, whether it's in business or in contracts, or if you've been hurt uh, for some reason or another, save this number so you aren't left out in the cold not knowing where to go. Here's where to go. The Gregory Law Firm, 662-397-9799. Nine seven nine nine. So this is a, a a tough game to react to. I know we did a little bit of post game yesterday, and now with twenty four hours plus to think about what happened, I think it's even harder to get a real reaction from this game one way or another. I think um, we saw the best of what this team could be, and also the worst of what this team is, and why. They have two losses to this point. It's a really difficult game to react to. There is a period in this game where they looked largely incredibly dominant. And there was also a period in this game where they still had self-inflicted errors and and sloppy play that kept a bad team hanging around for longer than they needed to hang around. Now, luckily for Ole Miss, it didn't end the way Kentucky did with a loss. They were able to come out of the locker room and execute and play well and win the game and do so kind of comfortably in the second half. But still, it's like you saw so much good and so much bad in the same game, and it's trying to decipher you know, why and what can continue and what can they correct and what will translate to Arkansas. And it's a tough, tough game to react to. But there's a few things that I saw and that you guys saw that we'll talk about tonight. First are the changes on the offensive line. Um, Micah Pettis getting uh, quote-unquote benched. Um, I know what what was said. I think that there's some hair splitting when it comes to why he didn't play, but I do think he didn't start and wasn't going to start uh, regardless. Um, I do believe that he has been banged up, that the injury thing is true. Uh, offensive linemen are often banged up. I do believe that he's hurt to some degree. But during the bye week, Lane Kiffin said going into the bye week, they were going to make changes on the offensive line. He, he said it on multiple different areas. They made personnel changes on the offensive line, and largely it worked. They held up well, especially in, in pass protection, really exclusively in pass protection. But they held up well, only gave up one sack against this Oklahoma defense, which is top 10 in the country, 
in sacks. It is a sack-making, tackle-for-loss generating Oklahoma front. I mean, they are tops in college football in those kind of explosive havoc play categories in this new Ole Miss offensive line. I say new. It's it's the same guys. They didn't, you know, claim somebody off of waivers, but the adjustments, the personnel adjustments that they made on the offensive line were good ones. And maybe they did some things schematically as well. I'm not smart enough to notice that, but they protected Jackson Dart well in this game against a defensive front that is very good at generating pressure in sacks. He only got sacked once in this game. And, and I think that is a, a very, that, that, you know, circle that and underline that. Again, I know they didn't run the football well. Um, I'm still very confused about why Ulysses Bentley is only getting five touches in a game. But at this point, whatever, uh, talking about it is just going to make all of you guys crazy. But uh, upon further review, if you will, the offensive line actually had a good day relative to what you've expected from them this season, what they have been this season, and who they were playing. I know Oklahoma's a bad team overall, and their record reflects that. Um, they are good at getting pressure, and they were not really able to get a whole lot of pressure uh, against Ole Miss in this game. Um, Dart was better, especially in the second half. Um, started three of eight. I think they did a good job calling this game to help him, but he helped himself as well. Um, th- that that play that we talked about in the post game, the the throw to Davis where he escaped pressure and and put one over the head. I mean, little things like that. That was kind of vintage Dart. Where in the first half, again, he started three of eight. A drop didn't help there, but really overthrew Caden Lee on a third down and just you know wasn't able to settle in and get comfortable. But use the tight end after the first possession anyway. But use the tight ends was accurate on the intermediate stuff, got the ball out faster, spread the ball around a little bit, tucked it and ran it sometimes. Now, there was a he missed a wide open Juice Wells like he didn't throw the ball. I, I mean, he just he he missed, I don't know if he saw him late or didn't realize until after uh that he was open, but there was an opportunity for a touchdown that that he did not throw the ball to, but um pulled it down and ran it some. I think a couple of times in the first half uh, made a poor decision, which is is funny because you spend all offseason talking about how Jackson Dart needs to protect himself better. But um, on third down at the goal line, you slide – or not at the goal line, but in goal-to-go territory, and you slide a yard short of the first down when you you could have gotten it and avoided the weird play call on fourth and short that led to no points on the drive – so it wasn't a perfect day by any stretch of the imagination. Definitely not a perfect start, but settled in in the second half and played well. Made good plays. Um, the, again, the aforementioned throw um, on the broken play was really good. Hit Watkins on not a deep ball, but not a, an intermediate ball either. Just kind of in between deep and intermediate. What was that, like a 35-yard, what would have been a touchdown pass if Watkins' knee was not down like this far from the end zone? Um So spread the ball around, was good in the intermediate stuff, settled into the game some, and in the second half had some of that swagger uh, back that that you have been missing. It it looked like he was able to just kind of relax and play football in the second half. And um, I think part of that is also aided by offensively, I think they called a really good game, and that includes the first half as well. Short yardage aside, we talked about it yesterday. I have no idea what they're trying to do in short yardage situations. But I think the overall game plan and the way they distributed the football and the way they called things to help Jackson out, get comfortable, short stuff, underneath stuff, use the tight ends, and then the over-the-top throw, you built some confidence. So I think even if you if you go back and, and look at the, their possessions, even in the first half, I think they still called a good game. Um, better execution extends drives even in the first half in which they struggled. So overall, I think that they offensively, they called a a really good game there. I am not at all worried uh, about the defense getting run on the way they did by Oklahoma uh, because we've seen better rushing offenses uh, do much worse against that defense, and they turned it on when they had to. Now, I do wonder, did did Oklahoma – were they able to do things that Ole Miss hadn't seen yet, and once they adjusted, it was game over? Um, you know, Arnold is is athletic and, and he can run a little bit and that 
the the way he was able to do that against this Ole Miss defense is concerning for Arkansas, who has a, a dynamic athlete at quarterback. But I do think that being worried about the first half defensively is not something that I would concern myself with too much outside of if Oklahoma found something that Ole Miss can't adjust to and Arkansas can't exploit it. That's obviously a big deal. But again, they they got ran on by a team that is not as good at running the football as other teams that could not against them. That front six is legit. Now, the linebacker group is pretty banged up uh, at this point, but not worried about that. I am still worried about penalties, and that is what brings me to the other side of this conversation. It's There there were some good things. They came out of the locker room and really shut the game down. Dart was better and a little bit more comfortable, and the offensive line adjustments, at least in pass protection, worked. But my goodness, they were still at times listless. They still defensively, were able to, I mean, one of their touchdown drives, Oklahoma's, one of their two touchdown drives was aided by 30 yards worth of Ole Miss penalties and just just dumb penalties as well. You had a drop in there. You had uh, a missed extra point. It still was a team that displayed at times lacking discipline. There was still the sloppiness. They didn't, they got off to a hot start and then, uh, I mean, just kind of sputtered for the rest of the half. And so, there are still so many questions to me about this team and can they play smart enough football to avoid letting somebody that they're better than hang around. They've done it too many times this year. And if you're going to go up to Fayetteville, a team that they, they are more talented than for sure. The odds makers think they're better, but it is such, it is so easy for opponents to hang with Ole Miss with the way they allow them to by doing things that are unforced dropped passes, bad mistake on special teams, bad inopportune penalties, weird stuff in short yardage situations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the the sloppiness in the first half being what it was coming off of a bye week is deeply concerning. They figured it out, but why still are they struggling to, to get Outside of their first possession, why are they struggling to get off the mat and execute early in these football games to put these teams away that they should have put should have put away that they didn't? LSU and Kentucky and even Oklahoma. So that's that's still something that just it concerns me about Fayetteville. And obviously, if they're able to get past Arkansas, same thing with Georgia as well. And then finally, um, Lane Kiffin after the game. And there was a clip that was shared in his press conference about where, where he was talking about, hey, at least you're not the only, or at least there's one more person in this town that thinks that you can still have a good season without winning a national championship or whatever. And the the clip that was being shared did not display the full context of the question and the answer and what led to that. He was asked about bowl eligibility. He gave the same answer that you're accustomed to of don't really care about that. That's not the goal, whatever. Um, But then I think, I don't know, but I I think he was trying to make a lighthearted joke about the intensity of expectations. I think that that's what was going on. But it's regardless of the context of the question and the answer, it's still such a unenforced error on Lane Kiffin's part because number one, I talk to you guys three times a week. I talk to our radio audience every single day. I don't remember ever talking about if they don't win the title, the national title, then it's a failure. It was more about, the fan base crowdfunded a roster to the tune of millions upon millions of dollars and your schedule sets up beautifully for you win 10 games and make the playoff. It was completely and totally rational expectations from the fan base, but it didn't start with the fan base and it didn't start with the media. It started with him. They did the the last dance thing. They called their team elite. 
They did all of those things. And so when you do all of those things and then say, albeit, I think he was trying to make a joke. I think he was trying to be lighthearted and joking. But still, when you promote yourselves as that and then lose to a god-awful Kentucky team and do the, well, expectations are out of control around here. No, you set them. They were your expectations. Don't blame fans for believing in what you saw as the $10 million head football coach of the many, many millions of dollars uh, that you have on your roster. That, that is something that you started. Nobody else. Last Dance was you. Using the word elite was you first. And just unenforced error on Kiffin's part. Really, really bizarre there. So those are some of my thoughts. I'll read uh, a bunch of your comments and we'll get out of here after I tell you the podcast is brought to you in part by Advantage Business Systems. Check them out online at absms.com. Advantage Business Systems has you covered for all of your office technology needs. Tell them I sent you and you'll get a complimentary office technology assessment. So again, if your business is in Mississippi and you need tech in the office, anything from copiers and printers and mail machines to data security and cloud storage, tell them I sent you and they'll come out and give you an assessment on me, Advantage Business Systems, absms.com. The podcast is also brought to you by Priority One Bank. They make you their priority every single day with local loan servicing and decision making. So if you need a loan or you've got a loan through them and you need some help with it, they've got you covered. Um, It is somebody that you'll sit down with face to face and not on Zoom or out of state because, again, Priority One Bank makes you their priority. Brian leads us off, says if they don't improve on offense, they'll lose in Fayetteville. They need to play a full game the way they played the third quarter this past weekend. They do. I mean, they, they've – because I think that Arkansas is going to be able to score a little bit. Now, I don't know – so, some people that I've interacted with over the last day or so uh, have for some reason put Arkansas up on this pedestal like they are 2010 Alabama, like they are just like this untouchable force. And, and look, Ole Miss can go up there and lose. They've done it before. They certainly will do it again, and it certainly could happen on Saturday. But I think that people are really overinflating what this Arkansas football team is. They got smoked at home by LSU just two weeks ago. I mean, we're non-competitive. And that was coming off of a bye week. And from the jump, they were completely out of the game. They they had no chance of winning that game from the second it was kicked off. I remember texting Haydad on LSU's first possession about that game. Like, oh, this one's over. Like it they go to Starkville, and yes, they score a lot of points. And they looked good doing it. Um, Mississippi State turned it over a lot in this game. Mississippi State is the worst team in the SEC, and it's not anywhere remote. They they are so far below Auburn, who beat or, or Kentucky. They're they're worse than Kentucky. They there is a gap between Auburn and Kentucky and Mississippi State that is wider than Auburn and Kentucky and Tennessee. Seriously, they are an atro- that Mississippi State's defense would struggle. Not just struggle. They would be one of the worst defenses in the Mid-American Conference. And how do I know that? Because I saw a Mid-American Conference team go down there and run the ball up and down the field on them. They are pathetic. Pathetic defensively. Awful. I mean, beyond awful. So yeah, Arkansas scoring a lot of points looks great. And it looks scary or whatever. There is not a single player that starts for Mississippi State there, there might be a safety that would play some. But otherwise, there is not a player that starts on State's defense that would get a single meaningful snap for Ole Miss in the Georgia Southern game. They, they, their personnel is so bad. And I, I think people are like looking at history and they're looking at like just last Saturday and putting Arkansas up on this pedestal that they are like this untouchable force and not that they're this deeply flawed football team. Um, that has an extremely talented quarterback um, or athletic quarterback, very inconsistent throwing the football. They've got a dude uh, up front on defense. I I think that I would take Oklahoma's defensive front, their front six anyway, or maybe the entire defense over that of Arkansas's. I mean, they're they're better than I and a lot of people thought they were. 
but people are uh, putting them on this level in which they have not earned that kind of respect right now. It is absolutely a losable game. I'm not saying that they're not going to lose that game, but a lot of people need to relax on what you think Arkansas actually is. This offense needs Trey Harris. Um, You know, what's funny is I think the absence of Trey Harris um, could have or could be the thing that wakes them up to, hey, maybe there are, Maybe there are a lot of weapons on this team whose names are not Trey Harris that can help win football games. May, may, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. But yes, Trey Harris will absolutely help when, when he is available. Could be worse for the Saints. They could be the Titans or see what happens to the Bears. Oh, jeez. <clears throat> Please get hate at tomorrow. He was so mad. State gave up 58 points and 10.7 yards per rush. Um, they're going two and 10. Yeah, they're going two and 10. We have now learned that while they were and have improved offensively, that the Texas and Georgia and Texas A&M games were more of a product of what was around Texas and Georgia and Texas A&M as opposed to they belong on the field with these teams now because they don't. The first half of that game looked a lot like Kentucky, didn't it? Oh, I mean, it was almost a carbon copy, wasn't it? Um, uh, What's interesting, though, I mean, positive spin or negative spin, it felt like going into that halftime locker room. I, I didn't go into the locker room, but it felt like at halftime as the team was going to the locker room that it's over. That I would be lying to you if I told you guys that I didn't have that thought of that the collapse is going to start, that it's over. They're going to, to either play tight or whatever, and they're going to lose this game, and it's going to be ugly around, like really ugly around here. And Kiffin and Dart, after the game, even talked about how the locker room, it was, it was, not, it was an ugly locker room at halftime. But they came out and they dominated. So is that a good thing that, you know, it's a program that's down bad, although it shouldn't be to some degree anyway. Uh, but it's a, it's a team that was that's just been dealing with a lot of stuff and there's just rumors and whatever, and just a lot of stuff happening. And they play poorly again in the first half of a game and they're getting booed off the field and is it a good thing that they came out and dominated uh, with all that uh, up against them? Is that a sign of of leadership finally taking over and then figuring some things out offensively and offensive line adjustments finally working? Or is it um, uh, still a major concern that they started what was such an important game in such a way that they were justifiably booed off the field? And by the way, shout out to the uh um sorry I'm losing my voice. Shout out to the uh the the Twitter user that said that I was the leader of the Twitter jerks for saying that fans were justified in booing a team off the field. Shout out to that person. It's going to depend on whether we get the first half team or the second. Now the one I'll give them credit here. I thought the final two quarters was the best half of football they've played this season. Strongly agree. Think they could have added more, but slowed it down like they tend to do. Absolutely, uh, went went very very conservative uh, in, in those possessions in the fourth. And I, I think I don't know. I think style points matter, um, and, and they kind of blew an opportunity to have some of those. But if they get to ten and beat Georgia, they're I think they're going to make the playoff. It's just the college football is going to breed losses it, it's just you're not going to have all these teams running the table people will lose in front of them and the georgia win if they get it will take them a long 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 way so opportunity for style points but do those matter i don't know yet we haven't seen the committee pick 12 teams yet still no game plan for bentley makes no sense to me but oh well Please tell you Ole Miss finally gets their left tackle back next week. Dart needs help. See, they they do in the running game, but again, I think they held up well. 
in pass protection. One sack against that front, that is a really good defensive front, guys. I mean, what, the top 10 in the country in sacks and tackles for loss, I believe, is Oklahoma. Um, so they they were okay there. But, yes, um, Williams coming back, if he's able, um, if he's healthy, you know. I mean, there's there's able to play, and then there's healthy enough to be impactful. Getting him back will help, for sure. You're not picking them to win in Fayetteville in the rain. Luckily, there's, you know, six more days for that forecast to change. So, who evaluates the portal guys seem to have missed on the offensive line guys this year. A lot of people evaluate the portal guys, a lot of them. But yes, offensive line at this point is still a, a, kind of a problem. But, I mean, again, the. If you want positive spin, they pass protected really well on Saturday, relatively speaking. No run game to speak of. Yesterday, finally, the tight ends were involved. And what do you know? It's effective. Who would have thought? It's almost like Caden Prescorn exists. Shout out to his wife for bullying Ole Miss into throwing the football to her husband. Thoughts on Lane whining about expectations from the town and fans, expectations that he and his team started? Yeah. I am behind on messages very clearly. But yeah, I think he was trying to make a joke, but it's still one of those situations where um, just shut up, just shut, just shut up. Don't tweet alligator pictures. Don't say stuff like that. Don't whine that your fans are leaving blowout games early. Just don't do crap like that. It's immature. That's what it is. It's immature. I think he was joking, but that's still just one of those things where just stop. It's lacking in self-awareness at best. You think Oklahoma not imploding on themselves, let that game stay closer than it could have been, but Ole Miss blew such a massive opportunity to put it away in the first half with that awful end around. Yeah. They're 6-2 and two and you're disappointed to show how expectations have changed. You just hope people realize they're there because of NIL and will need NIL to get there in the future. Absolutely. But, I mean, we'll see what these next four games bring. Because if it completely craters, if the bottom just totally falls out, I know that the right answer is to continue to get rosters like this to continue to be competitive. But I'm going to have a hard time telling people that the way to win is for you to donate money when you did that and look at how it was managed. These four weeks are, they're, they're massive in so many ways. Lane's comments after the game were a bad look. Don't like that at all. Another one thought Dart was really good overall. This is an underrated performance of his. You don't know if people will appreciate as much. This is what this team is on offense. Just not good enough to press defenses for tons of points. And they're so limited at running back with little lanes to run through. Parrish is clearly hurt. And they're, they're choosing, they're, they're continuing to choose to not play their best running back. I mean, they're, they're actively choosing not to play their best running back. It is a choice that they are making. And it makes no sense. It makes no sense at all. Um, I mean, can Bentley really change everything about the running game? No, but can he do things that Parrish cannot? Yes. A line is the hardest sport spot to pick up good talent, which they could get top high school talent, but for some reason can't pull them because they're rare. Defense with that. That's, I mean, it's just, it's simple. They're just rare. Re- ready to go offensive linemen are just very rare. This defense without penalties would be truly elite. It didn't feel like Oklahoma earned either of those two drives, not to mention a clear missed hold on Oklahoma's second touchdown drive. Yeah. The Piggies package clearly works. So why was that not on the field on fourth and one? This is the same stuff we've talked about in the LSU game. And um, so they did stop him. They got it once. Um, and then he he made a play on another one. But I would like to see them throw in some wrinkles out of that as opposed to just kind of the same thing, just snap it to him. And, I mean, it's worked. It's It's really worked. So it's hard to say that they should do something different. But now that it's kind of been snuffed out a little bit, but, yeah, I hated that end-around call. I mean, it was a long-developing play. 
where you, it's third and three feet, right? That's all it is. And, or excuse me, fourth and three feet. That's all it is. And it's a long developing like end around where when the ball carrier gets the ball, he's five yards behind the line of scrimmage and his shoulders are perpendicular to the first down marker. I mean, he he is facing the sideline when he gets the ball, and it already took him took you a while to get him the ball. So that takes a you allow penetration when it takes that long, and when the ball carrier gets the ball, he's not going downhill; he's going sideways. So he has to then turn up field. I just I'm surprised that that was the call there. If it's 17-7, Ole Miss at the half instead of 14-10, then 10-14. Oklahoma, then things would have been fine, but the offense pulls this stunt almost every game, going cold turkey in the red zone. And I don't – I mean, going for it there, I don't hate it. I mean, it's – just call better plays. Do we really expect them to score a lot of points on a pretty decent Arkansas defense on the road in the rain? If Trey Harris isn't playing, that's a huge red flag. Yeah, we'll see about the rain. Just there's a lot of time left, and now that I said that, it's going to rain like hell. But back to back 15 yard penalties on that drive, the first of which extended the drive on third down, then allows the touchdown. I mean that that is if you want to complain about the defense, that's where you that's where you do it is being too conservative on obvious passing situations late in games and penalties. This team has shown you nothing to make you think they have a chance against Georgia. Generally, no, but here's the thing. Uh, here's the thing about that. This, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying that they're going to win that game either. I'm not. I, I don't think they will, personally. But when you look at just the SEC and how inconsistent everybody has been. I mean, this is a Georgia team that only beat Kentucky by one. This is a Georgia team that lost to what we're now learning is a mediocre Alabama team for them. Mediocre for them. Or for what you expect Alabama to be. But still, like not a great Alabama team beat them. They, I know that what they looked like against Texas, they did. But a week later, that same Texas team gave up 40%. 40% 40% of Quinn Ewers' pass attempts, he was pressured or sacked. Pressured, hit, or sacked. 40%. So that Georgia defensive front dominated that Texas offensive line, and so did Vanderbilt. So, yes, Georgia's very, very, very good. Schumann's great at what he does, and they have dudes, and I don't think Ole Miss is going to be able to block those dudes, and, and, and they're in for it. But also, when you look at this Georgia offense, Beck is a turnover machine. They, they don't have the best weapons, or at least for them anyway, recently. Like, there's a real chance that this could be a really close, low-scoring game. And the, the inconsistencies that you've seen from everybody, Georgia's gettable. Everybody's gettable. All, even the good teams in the SEC, the teams at the top, are gettable. By anybody. Almost anybody. So. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't pick it today, but Georgia has not been like this machine that people are expecting them to be. This Kentucky loss will be remembered as one of the worst losses in the modern era of Ole Miss football. It gets worse and worse every single week. Every single week. Early kick, Arkansas doesn't play good defense. There's a chance the game looks similar to the South Carolina game. Yeah, I mean, that that's the one thing. <laughs> Ole Miss this year, when they went on the road in a hostile environment, they shut it up right away. I mean, just locked it in and shut it up right away, which when you look at the other SEC games, it's like, how the hell did that happen? Um, but, yeah. If they're going to win the Arkansas game, they better make it look like South Carolina. Yeah. You said all the attention. They need to take one game at a time. They're getting the cart ahead of the horse. I, I think that it's a combination of a lot of things. Um, the pressure and expectations may be a part. The um, – 
maybe some egos, uh, maybe some mismanaging of personalities. If you set the over under at eight and a half wins, would I still take the over? (sighs) No, I wouldn't. I don't think. You don't think Charlie West Jr. will be the offensive coordinator next year either, do I? Do I think there's a chance of Walter Nolan holding out? Um, I, I mean, I, I wish I could give you more. I have no way of knowing, but I, I don't. I, I'm a little confused by the question. Um, he plays hard as hell. Uh, he, he's truly hurt. I mean, he, he's been battling that ankle injury for for weeks, and I mean, look genuinely like angry that they wouldn't. I. I, I Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm misreading the situation and and trying to read too much into Kiffin's quotes and or not reading enough into them. I, I don't know, but I just I, I don't think that when you can look at the way Walter Nolan has played for Ole Miss that you can describe the guy as a quitter. I just I, I have not. And again, maybe internally it's happening. Maybe he did hold out of the second half. It didn't look like that's what was happening. Um, but I could just not be seeing it the same way other people did. I mean, I talked to somebody at the game that, like, I mean, d- described his, like, sideline demeanor as angry, but not, like, mad at Ole Miss, but, like, mad that he, he wasn't in the game. Maybe he's just, his body language is different. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just kind of waffling here. I don't, I cannot give you an answer, but I, I don't think that the way he's played gives you an indication that he's he's quit. Thought at half there was a chance they would not win another game the rest of the season. Yeah. Can't seem to understand why the play calling is so bad. Lane has had less talent and done way more with it than he is now. I'm just completely stunned. I feel something is going on behind the scenes. I had to, I don't know what it is. Um, I, I really don't. But I do think that they called a better game than the output indicates this past Saturday. So at least there's that. Still think if they go 10-2, and they make the playoffs? Yes, I do. Just it's college football. There's there's five weeks of it. Losses happen to everybody. I mean, losses are going to happen. A ten win SEC team with a win over Georgia is going to get them in. They will have in this scenario one in Columbia, South Carolina, one in Fayetteville, one in Gainesville, and beat Georgia. Now I know, I know that they lost to Kentucky, and that's a terrible loss. But their other one is an overtime loss in Tiger Stadium. You, you've got to remember that, one, uh, the, these teams are going to beat each other up. I mean, Alabama's about to get a third loss. My, Missouri's out of it. Um, Ole Miss will be ahead of Missouri. The, there there are losses coming for people. Um, I mean, Vanderbilt's got an opportunity to get Tennessee out of here, for example. Um, and on and on and on. So teams are going to lose. Maybe they don't get in at 10 and 2, but a, a 10 win SEC team is going to get in over a 10 win ACC team or a 10 win Big 12 team unless they have won the conference. I think. I don't know, but I think. Laramie Tunsils don't grow on trees. No, they do not. Considering how little production Judkins has at o- Ohio State in this limited Ole Miss run game, maybe both parties should have gotten their acts together and made an agreement. Yeah, it's one of those rare situations where. Like like in a, a trade in the NFL, everybody tries to figure out you know who which side won, who won the trade. If this is a quote unquote trade, I know it's not, but just work with me here. Both sides lost. He's not been good at Ohio State. He has not been starting. As I said, and you know, people just the the two other people on the radio show just wanted to disagree with me uh, about Travion Henderson and. It, Okay, um, you're wrong, but okay. And hey, look who got one right. It's a rare thing, so I got to brag about it. But he's he's not playing well when he's playing. He's not the starter. Hell, he might not even be the second best back on the team. They ran a play action with Big for a touchdown in the 2022 Egg Bowl. He has more athleticism than people think, absolutely. 
You've got the 2014 Arkansas game racking your brain. Oh, God bless you. Don't look at that. Ole Miss has not scored 30 points in an SEC game since last year against Texas A&M. Saturday would be a good chance for them to do that. They need to. It seems like Lane wasn't scheming for the tight ends. Maybe it's just you, but it felt like Jackson was hinting at that in his press conference. Um, If he was, then that's not totally fair because there have been times where his tight ends have been open and he has not thrown them the football. So, Eighth in SEC and scoring dead in the middle at 25 points per game. Not good. Indiana's coach, Clark Lee, they're being super successful with top teams. Why can't Kiffin do that with more talent? I love him, but that doesn't make any sense. Um, There are people that would tell you that Kirk Signetti is a better coach than Lane Kiffin. It's possible. It's true. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that you're right. I mean, could you imagine if Ole Miss was playing Vanderbilt this weekend in Nashville? How would you feel about that? Which is crazy to say because they lost to Georgia State, but they're good, man. They're they're good and they're mentally tough. Um, I don't know. But I do know that Kiffin has elevated Ole Miss up until this point, too. Could Clark Lee have come to Ole Miss and done what Lane Kiffin did? No. Nope. Zero percent chance. No, I mean, zero percent chance. Uh, There's a real chance that Clark Lee had struck gold with Diego Pavia and hiring his former head coach. Which isn't totally fair because he's doing a great job. But, I mean, I just, I, I refuse to believe that Clark Lee could have come to Ole Miss and four years later won 11 games. Just refuse it. So, you sense A&M has a loss coming this week in Columbia, South Carolina. Ooh, see, but that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about because absolutely that can happen. Absolutely that can happen. Is there a way Georgia loses to Florida and Ole Miss and Ole Miss gets left out going 10-2? I, I, I have no idea. Uh, the, there is such a air of unknown with how the committee is going to select 12 teams. And he's a six and a half point dog at Auburn. Such disrespect. Massive disrespect. Terrible. Love the doors in that one. Happy for AM. You honestly was pulling for them. Can't put your hate away for LSU, but you hate it makes the strength of schedule looks worse. Good for Elko. Great hire. Quarterback change. That was the difference in that one. Did the Oklahoma offensive line just kind of stop trying there at the end? It made no sense. How many sacks in a row was it? Um, I mean, I think part of it is when it was obvious that they had to throw the football, then it was elite defensive line against porous offensive line, and they were probably a bit worn out and just – I don't know. I don't think they stopped trying. I just – I think that showed you – both how good Ole Miss is and how bad Oklahoma is in those spots. Kentucky isn't winning another league game this year, 4-8 and eight for the Cats with a win over number six Ole Miss. Isn't that great? 13th in rushing offense, it's a big issue, especially when the field gets shorter. And so counter to what you're used to seeing from Lane Kiffin, but again, they choose to play the running back that – they refuse to play their best running back. I don't know how much that would help, but I know it can't hurt. Is JJ still struggling with a lingering injury? Yes. Uh, that that shoulder is is bothering him badly. Badly. Guessing any talk of Mississippi State having momentum on the radio show is going to come to an end. Oh, buddy. We just, we now know that they played three top 15 teams relatively close because they weren't taken seriously. That's what we know now. They weren't taken seriously. They were they were overlooked. 
And yeah, Ole Miss is a touchdown favorite at Arkansas. They should win this game. Doesn't mean they will, but they should. Ten sacks counted for Ole Miss. And frankly, it should have been more. Hell, it should have been 14. Uh, Missed a few. And Arnold's athletic. So it's not like he's a statue back there. In fact, he's a great athlete. He's an elite athlete. Uh, So it should have been, instead of 10, it should have been 14 or so. One rush of 20 yards in league play. Guess who did that? Yeah. In one game, he had as many rushes. What's the stat? In one game, he had as many rushes of over eight yards than his counterpart did all season. We'll see. Anyway, I got to run, guys. Thank you so much, as always, for uh, being here and taking part. This is a lot of fun. I hope you liked it. And uh, we'll be back on Tuesday. Uh, No live on Thursday because it's Halloween. We're going trick-or-treating. Uh, but I will have a video. I'll, I'll have a pregame video up. But, yeah, we're, we're, we're going trick-or-treating. Uh, but you guys are the best. Thank you. And uh, I'll see you live on Tuesday. A Super Talk Mississippi media production.